They did it. The Pacers finally won three games in a row after the All-Star break. They beat the Raptors. Their offense was humming. They stay in sixth place. Tyrese Halliburton scores 30 points. And, man, did it not look like any of that was going to happen. We'll explain it all today on the Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, y'all? Happy Wednesday, and welcome into another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers, as always. My name's Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and SI, and today, I'm very sick. I'll be powering through. Apologies for any awkward cuts in the video or audio like you got yesterday. We're going to make it happen, though, and we're going to talk about Pacers, Raptors, Pacers win. They score a bunch of points. Tyrese Halliburton scored a bunch of points. They stayed in sixth. And it did not look like any of that was going to happen when the game started and got going. Plus, Standings Watch, an update, because everybody, including me, missed a key part of Standings Watch about the Pacers and what they need to do to close out the season and actually make the playoffs. Although winning Tuesday night, obviously a big part of the Pacers doing exactly that. Pacers end up beating the Raptors 140-123. to 123. Oh, man, did this look like a typical wobbly Pacers game from the start, though. No one... Saw this coming. This, well, no one saw this win coming, I should say, after the early portion of the game. If you've been keeping up with the Pacers, you know that they have been struggling with bad teams. They've been getting off to slow starts, and it's cost them time after time. Well, they sucked in the first quarter of this game. Once again, the Raptors were all over them. The Raptors were up 13-4 to in the blink of an eye. Their lead reached 12 about six minutes into the game, and then again at the end of the first quarter. And it was all the Pacers beating themselves to me. That's what stood out about the beginning of this game. They had six turnovers in the first quarter. The Pacers did some sluggish passes, some lazy dribbling, some poor execution. It was awful. On the other end, the Raptors had seven offensive rebounds, just kicking butt. Miles Turner, Jalen Smith were bad in the first quarter of this game. And all of a sudden, the Pacers, who set themselves up for destiny, all they have to do is win the rest of their games, they make the playoffs. They're on 10 after one quarter. They looked terrible. They couldn't get anything going. The Raptors were outplaying them significantly. They couldn't stop Bruce Brown. They couldn't stop Javon Freeman Liberty, a two-way player who had 14 points in the first quarter. His career high entering the game was 16. Bruce Brown was cooking. I don't need to go on and on. The Pacers' start to this game was awful. And finally, something they haven't done very much after these slow starts, they figured it out. They really figured it out really fast. 40 points in the second quarter of this game for the Pacers. Their offense started down. Their second unit was once again very special. TJ McConnell was amazing. We'll talk about him later. Obi Toppin was amazing. We'll talk about him later. Ben Shepard made threes. He should just always play in Toronto. Isaiah Jackson was very impactful. And the bench did what they do and trim into lead. When the starters came back in, right, we heard this from a lot of people being interviewed on the Bally broadcast. They realized how terrible they started. Right, TJ McConnell during his halftime interview said they started playing better when they decided to grow up and mature during the game. He said they were getting beat to all the 50 50 balls and the Raptors were getting every rebound. Halliburton said after the game that they just had to wake up, right? They were sleepwalking to begin the game. That can't happen. That's unacceptable for the Pacers in their current reality. To their credit, though, they did figure that out. And when the starters came back in late in that second quarter, they were terrific. They absolutely cruised in that last five to seven minutes of the half. The Pacers got the lead by halftime after making some hellacious shots uh, late in the first half. The starters in the second quarter in limited minutes were all awesome, plus nine or more, all making shots, all making threes, and the Pacers were ahead. And that is how they got this done, is they never looked back offensively. That's how the Pacers won this game, is they've struggled with this Raptors team. They have let the Raptors cut them to death. The Raptors defense has been good enough to get in transition against the Pacers and score 130 like they did recently. Right, The Pacers did win once. It was a tight game right before the break. But the Raptors in general, with their style and their speed, they have been tough for the Pacers. Yeah, they were missing some good players, but the Pacers really figured it out this time. They really cut up the Raptors defense in a way that was meaningful and looked better than most of their games against talented defenses. And that is how they just kept rolling in the second half. Everybody who played was terrific on offense. In the second half, six points for Siakam, 10 for Turner, five for Nemhard, 15 for Halliburton, six for McConnell, 18 for Toppin, eight for Shepard. 
Isaiah Jackson on the glass and with two points. They scored 75 in the second half to get it done. So the theme of this game would be is similar to what I said after the Heat win Sunday. I said, well, actually, I said this yesterday. For the Pacers specifically, they have not won three in a row since the break. They've struggled against these crappy teams after big wins. I think that there's a chance that, one, the gravity of the situation, and two, finally getting over their clutch bugaboos on Sunday is going to transform their mentality in a way that could allow them to get over some of that stuff. And when they had their slow start, I thought, never mind. This team's still young. They're still inexperienced. They are not quite ready for this moment. This is going to be terrible. They're going to have to sweep the weekend to even have a chance to make the playoffs. And instead, they were fantastic in the second half of this game. And really, from the time the first quarter buzzer sounded to the end of the game, they dominated the Toronto Raptors offensively. So credit to the Pacers for growing up a bit, but they are getting credit for overcoming an obstacle that they created for themselves. So uh, a bit of an odd one there, but they did get it done. And the leader of it all offensively was Tyrese Halberton, who only had five assists, but had 30 points in this game. And he only took, or eight, I guess only is, is a stretch here, but he took eight threes and made three of them. He was crushing it cruising towards the basket and forcing the Raptors to rotate and getting to those layups he's been making recently where his finishing just looks a little funky in a good way. And he made them on two point shots. He was seven for eight and he got to the line 10 times because of that attacking. That's how you have a dominant 30 point game offensively is attacking the rim and the threes were falling. He hit two in the first quarter that really kept the Pacers in it after just a miserable start, but he's had 30 points in a while. That was Halliburton's first 30-point game since the All-Star break, obviously. The last time he scored 30 in a game was January 3rd against the Milwaukee Bucks when he had 31. That is the level his offense reached in this game, something we have not seen from Tyrese Halliburton in literally three months. And I don't know if this is a sustainable, they should go to this all the time thing, but I have wondered if they do make the playoffs, they're in the play and whatever, they're going to need him to be the guy, the engine, the offensive force for this team. And he hasn't been that of late well he really was in this game with the 30 points attacking all the time not letting whatever flimsy raptors defense is being thrown at him deter him and the rest of the pacers just kind of fell in line right way fewer shot attempts than normal for siakam who only took 10 and played 26 37 because obi toppin couldn't come off the floor miles turner only took 10 shots right Halliburton dominated the ball in a way that was actually constructive this time. And it wasn't him passing like it was against OKC last Friday. It wasn't him setting other guys up. It wasn't him taking a bunch of threes. It was him attacking the rim, playing from there, getting the Raptors in rotation. And the Raptors were not ready for it. That's how the Pacers generated so many good shots. That's how Halliburton himself scored. So easily 33 assists for the Pacers. They made 16 threes. And that all kind of stems to me from Halliburton attacking the basket and getting it done. The starters in general, though, had a good approach to me, right? Siakam and Turner, both six for 10 on their way to 16 points. Siakam was awesome on the offensive glass to get it done. Turner made some threes to get it done. We saw some Turner, no Siakam minutes in the first quarter. Aaron Eastman started terribly, but really picked it up in the second half. Andrew Nemhard was guarding RJ Barrett all night and had a solid enough game. Eight assists for Andrew Nemhard actually led the Pacers. His slashing was just as valuable as anyone's in this game. So the thesis of this game to me would be, are the Pacers growing up? Is this finally what they need to be a team that can get over the hump when they do it to themselves that they don't, you don't deserve credit for all that kind of stuff. But we saw them lose to the nets. We saw them lose to the bulls, the Cavs, all these teams since the all-star break in this one, they did not let the poor start deter them and keep them off their game. They got it done. They got the win. They have 46 wins now, 46 and 34 hour. The Pacers still control their own destiny for the postseason. We'll get to all that later because, uh, the, a crazy night for the Pacers who could have clinched a playoff spot on Tuesday. Everything went wrong for them in that regard. We'll explain all that later, but I want to talk about Obi Toppin and TJ McConnell next before we do any of that though. I want to talk to you guys about game time now an authorized ticket marketplace of major league baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier prices on the game time app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch with killer last minute deals, all in prices views from your seat and their lowest price guarantee game time takes the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets. That's what makes it so great. Every single thing I just said right there in the app, you can hop in and see last minute tickets in their flash deals or their zone deals, depending on where you want to sit. Every MLB game you could think about, or even other events. I went to a WNBA game in New York. I went to see the Dallas Wings play the New York Liberty. I used game time and it was awesome. You could see the view from your seat. Like I said, the price I saw was the price I paid. There was no nonsense on the back end like everywhere else. 
I knew it was the lowest price because their lowest price guarantee. They have all sorts of protections like event cancellation and job loss. It's the best way to buy tickets to any event. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Lockdown NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem the code L O C K E D O N M B A for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. And we are back here on Lockdown Pacers. Thanks for making us your first listen today. And every single day for your second listen, check out Lockdown NBA. Hear the latest and greatest from around the association. And I hosted the show with Swipe Cam from Lockdown Nuggets, getting into Giannis, getting injured, the crazy beginning of Clippers Suns. The Clippers from 30 in the first quarter. Golden State getting a huge win over the Lakers and plenty more about the seeding races around the league, particularly in the West. Lockdown NBA, your second listen. After this, if you need to hear me babble, about all things NBA. Let's talk about two bench guys who were fantastic. I am just out of stuff to say about TJ McConnell, and I know I've said that exact line about him before, but every game, he is just so reliable with that shot now. He gets into the paint, you're toast as a defense. You have to find a way to keep him out of the paint completely. If he gets eight feet away, it's money. He made a three in this game too, but if he gets 10 feet away, you're panicking. If he gets right to the rim, you're panicking because he can pass seven assists in this game. Eight for 13 was McConnell. Made a three, a huge corner three in the first quarter. Him and McDermott, back-to-back possessions, hit threes that were extremely meaningful for the Pacers to trim into that Raptors lead when they were playing so awful at the start of this game. Teams just cannot stay in front of TJ McConnell, right? And, and I know that this is not new information. I wrote a whole story about this last year about you know how he gnashes from in the lane to out to back in, how his low center of gravity is hard to stay in front of, how... He just sees space and goes to it, even if it's not necessarily his favorite spot. It makes a defense rotate or think or do something. But for this Pacers team of late who needs a kick in the pants with their bench group, he's been the guy. And that's something I talked about when Ben Matherin got hurt is he's going to have to be this guy. And he has every game They need him to step up offensively and score or get the bench in motion or just have a terrific game. He has 17 points, a bunch of them in the first half, seven assists, two boards. They won his minutes. They once again played him with the starters deep into a half because they can't take him off the floor. He was phenomenal once again, and it's just becoming such a trend that he's been their second, third, fourth, whatever, best player since the All-Star break. They need him to play. I know he's 32 and 21 minutes, maybe all is he can go with. You know, Halliburton played 31, right? You you need two ball handles on the floor at all times. Nemard had a nice game, but he was just terrific, right? Just terrific once again. So reliable for this Pacers team of late. And I, I continue to wonder, can they continue to use him this way? Can they continue to rely on him? Or will this be something that the water drains at some point? I don't think so, given the way he's doing it and how long he's been doing it for now. But this game in particular, he was just unguardable. There was a great basket in the second half. I don't remember who set the screen. I believe it was Isaiah Jackson. And TJ McConnell took the screen to get about 10 feet from the basket. And Bruce Brown, former Pacer, was the guy who got screened. And McConnell just rose up from 10 feet and buried it. And he yells at Bruce Brown, stop going out of those screens. <laughs> Quinn Buckner on the broadcast was cracking up. Bruce Brown, I don't know how he felt about it, but McConnell drilled the shot. Obviously, you got to do that. If you're going to yell like that, it, that's what he's become, right? You cannot defend him that way. You have to come at him. You have to make him uncomfortable the second he drives. You have to send a second guy, but he's a good passer. He's got good vision. It's just really hard to cover him. And that's why he was so good in this game. Eight for 13 on his way. 217 points without a free throw attempt. Another terrific game for TJ McConnell. Old, reliable. If he has two more of those for the Pacers, that would be great news heading into the rest of their season. Equally great, maybe better, Obi Toppin, who is just rolling right now. Obi Toppin, 10 for 14. That's the most makes of any player on the team. Tied with Halburn, but he did it on fewer shots. He made three threes. He had five boards. He had two assists, a steal, a block, 23 points for Mr. Toppin. They couldn't get him off the floor. They played lineups with him in the 4-5 again. They did funky stuff with their center rotations. They could continue to maximize Obi Toppin in this game. He has found ways to be wiggly and effective in this last week. Right? Even entering this game, his last four games, 14 against Brooklyn at home on effective shooting, 14 in Brooklyn on effective shooting, 15 against OKC, 13 against Miami, then 23 tonight. And I continue to be impressed by the threes, obviously. you know, Before the season, all the talk was, well, he's going to pair well with Alberton. He can finish around the rim. He's going to be a great transition player. He's going to slide right in to this Pacer style. And he has. He's been very good, especially with their second unit. But the thing that stands out, even though we knew he'd be good as a fit inside the arc, he just makes all his twos. In this game, seven for seven on twos. So many dunks. I, I believe all of his twos were dunks. I might be off 
by one there. And they were just demoralizing, right? That kind of said everything about the Raptors defense. They could not keep Obi Toppin out of the paint, out of the lane, away from the rim. Every shot he wanted was there for him. And it was usually a shot right at the rim, which, which was a dunk or a layup or whatever. A lot of them set up by Halliburton, a very funny one in transition set up by Halliburton where they were too close to the rim, but Toppin still scored, right? He had that kind of night where he was focused. He was hitting shots. He was really tough to defend. This is what we, we've seen from Toppin for a while. You know, Alex Golden and I talked about this last week, which is his the thing that stands out about him since the All-Star break is he's just very consistent, right? He very rarely is just so off on offense that you can't play him. His defense is inconsistent, right? Very rickety. In this game, it was good enough, and his offense continues to be so good that they can't hardly get him off the floor. He's he's the first sub in all the time. They keep him in there. He's playing the five sometimes. Another brilliant game from Obi Toppin, and the dunks were just crushing. I mean, they just demoralized the Raptors, made it impossible for Toronto to get any sort of rhythm. Their fans were taken out of the game. Their players were taken out of the game. A lot of them, like, stopped a run or did just something meaningful for the momentum of the game. That kind of stuff can be so valuable. Obi Toppin and TJ McConnell, both fantastic for the Pacers' second unit in this game. Also fantastic defensively especially Ben Shepard who played a bunch of minutes because Aaron Neesmith was in foul trouble and Ben Shepard three for nine from three not great but getting nine up important made some huge corner threes 11 points they needed him to play quite a bit again foul trouble for Aaron Neesmith McDermott was not very good in his minutes uh they needed Ben Shepard a lot and he was reliable he played with the starters at one point in the fourth quarter he was in there Toppin was in there and three starters were in there if he can defend like that maybe just playing in Toronto is the thing for him if he can hit shots at that level he just becomes very important to this Pacers team as a 3 and D kind of guy. And he was that in this game. Plus 12 for Ben Shepard, the highest of any Pacers bench player. Although, again, that's because he played with the starters for at least a decently significant stretch of this game. Other bench notes, Doug McDermott, 10 minutes in the first half. He did not play against the Heat. That was not a thing that stunned me, right, as they would trim their rotation for these important games. 10 minutes for him in this one. And he was one for four from deep. And he got back cut pretty quickly for a bucket. I can't remember who it was. He had a foul. I think Gary Trent Jr., He's got to make the threes if he's going to play, right? That's just what he's out there for. The shot looks so good. He gets him up so quick, but he's just so limited in other areas that they've got to go in. And one for four was not good enough. He did not play in the second half. Also not very good. Jalen Smith in this game, four minutes and 19 seconds. He had one offensive rebound. He was one for two from the field, but he just had too many lapses in that stretch. Carlisle opts to take him out. The, the Raptors just getting every rebound in the first quarter for Isaiah Jackson. Isaiah Jackson was ready to go and was so deserving of the minutes he got in this game. Isaiah Jackson finishes with 18 minutes of playing time, two for three from the field, seven boards, five of them were offensive, four points, two blocks. He was also a very good plus minus player. So the bench was unique in this game, right? They went to McDermott more than they normally do. They went to Isaiah Jackson as their backup five. They mix and match with the starters a little bit because of how good Toppin and McConnell were. And yet the bench was fantastic once again. That's a huge theme for the Pacers. If their starters just keep them in the game, the bench will win it for them. They beat the Raptor starters early in the fourth quarter. They get it done, and McConnell and Toppin were the reasons why. And now the Pacers, 46 and 34, 80 games played. They control their own destiny for five. They control their own destiny for the playoffs. But let's talk about standings. Watch debunk a myth about this weekend and look ahead to what the Pacers are facing. But before we do any of that, this next segment is brought to us. By our sponsor, BetterHelp. Sometimes you only have the opportunity to get something off our chest, big or small. Certain things in life can really start to get to you. It is important to let that out, especially to someone who is unbiased on your life. So today, I want to say how I really feel about something. You want to be thinking the same thing this week. I hate that the NBA did not keep the rule for the in-season tournament where if you're a certain number of games back, you're just out by default. Who wants to watch the Hawks and the Bulls, who are seven games away from eight, be in the plan? Why do they deserve to be in the plan it's meant to reward and keep teams f fighting late in the season. This is not keeping teams fighting. This is just keeping floundering teams on the floor. It's stupid. They should fix it. And yet, therapy can be different for everyone. Most of us have bigger problems than our favorite sports team or the playing tournament structure. And it's important to get things off your chest every once in a while. If you've been thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be flexible and suited to your schedule. So visit BetterHelp.com slash LockdownNBA to get 10% off your first month. Again, that's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P.com slash LockdownNBA. And we're back here on Lockdown Pacers. Thanks for making us your first listen today and every single day for your second listen. Lockdown Raptors with Sean Woodley. Hear about the loser's perspective of this game and hear about the Raptors. Can they beat the Heat once this weekend? The Pacers would like to see that. The Heat close their season against the Raptors twice in a row. All right, let's issue a faux pas and talk about how this got confusing for everyone. If you watch the game, you heard on the broadcast something that I've said before as well. 
the Pacers won this game against the Raptors. And so the thinking was, if they go one and one this weekend, that's enough to make the playoffs because one and one would be enough for them to finish the same or better than the Sixers and Heat, where they have the tiebreaker over both of them, right? That makes sense to me. But something snuck in that nobody caught. And the NBA tweeted it out on Tuesday morning. The Pacers were a part of a clinch scenario to earn a playoff spot on Tuesday. To hap- to make it happen, the Pacers had to win their own game, which they did. And they needed the Pistons to beat the Sixers, whatever, didn't happen. The Magic to beat the Rockets, whatever, didn't happen. And the Hawks to beat the Heat. The Heat won, everybody got. The Sixers won, everybody got. Why is the Orlando Magic in there, though? Why does it matter to the Pacers if the Magic win? Well, it's very important, actually, that the Magic are in there because of a weird quirk in three-way tiebreakers. In three-way tiebreakers, if a team wins a division, they get the top spot in the three-way tiebreaker, even if their head-to-head record against the other two teams is the worst. The Southeast division will be won by either Orlando or Miami, who are both two games apart right now with just a few games to go. And so the Magic mattered to the Pacers because if the Magic and the Heat finish with the same record, the Heat have the tiebreaker, and the Heat would win the Southeast Division, which matters to the Pacers because if the Pacers, Magic, and Heat all finish with the same record, the Heat would win that tiebreaker, the Magic would be second, and the Pacers would be third. All that to say, if the Pacers went 1-1 one and one in this coming weekend and finished 47-35, and 35, well, the Magic and Heat could have finished that way, and the Pacers would be out. So 1-1 one and one is actually not good enough for the Pacers unless the Heat lose or unless the Magic win, ideally both for the Pacers. Magic have Bucks twice, and uh, I can't remember their other game, the Sixers to close out. Pacers really want the Magic to beat the Sixers, but any of those wins would be good enough. Uh, or the Heat to lose, preferably twice, maybe once they play the Mavericks tonight. He were in double OT with the Hawks on Tuesday, so maybe they'll have some tired legs, and then they close with Toronto. Toronto. So it's a kind of a push and pull if you're the Pacers, right? If the Magic lose a bunch, that three-way tiebreaker gets more plausible and scarier and a way that you can miss the postseason even with a nice win this weekend as the Pacers. But if the Magic lose enough, you could pass them in the standings if you're the Pacers, right? So it's kind of a tough tug and pull of what they want, how they want this to go. So I don't know what I think fans should want. To me, if the Pacers can get wiggle room and be able to lose a game and still make it, that seems like the best outcome. So let's say Wednesday night the Magic beat the Bucks and the Heat lose to the Mavs. That'd be great for the Pacers, even though it would make it hard for the Pacers to catch the Magic. Whereas the Magic losing, and the Bucks, by the way, just lost Giannis Antetokounmpo to a calf injury. They won their game, though, so the two seed no longer possible for the Pacers. But all that said, that is not a bad outcome. The Magic winning a game, maybe two, is not a bad outcome for the Pacers just because of that funky three-way tiebreaker scenario. I hate that division crowns count like that. The head-to-head should be the first one to me. That seems like a good way of determining who's the better team. But that's where the Pacers are right now. They actually do control their own destiny still, of course. They just have to win out, right? They would finish fifth for sure at, at worst if they went out because they play the Cavs on Friday. The Cavs play tonight on Wednesday. They play Memphis, then they play Indiana, and then they play another crappy team. I can't remember. If the Cavs lose on Wednesday, I'd have to double check this, but that could help the Pacers be able to go one and one. Pacers beat the Cavs. They would get the head-to-head tiebreaker over the Cavs. So Cleveland losing tonight would be huge for the Pacers and their chances to finish ahead of the Cleveland Cavaliers. The Knicks also won last night. They beat the Bulls, but the Hawks lost, even though the Pacers probably wanted the Hawks to win because they were playing the Heat. But the Bulls are one game ahead of the Hawks still. Both of those teams have three games left. If it's decided going into the last day, perhaps the Hawks rest players. The Hawks play the Pacers on that Sunday in Indy to close out the season. So as you can see, there's still a lot of dynamics at play. And it all comes from this three-way tiebreaker with the Magic. It'd be very straightforward for the Pacers otherwise. They could just go one and one, finish ahead of Philly and Miami, and call it a day. But the chance that the Magic are a part of that as well at 47 wins, they only have 46 right now, is still scary for the Pacers. And the Pacers can catch a bunch of teams. They can still get to three, although New York made that harder with their success last night. They could still win their division in theory uh, if they win out and a lot of other craziness happens. Actually, I'm not certain about that. Actually, yes, they can. The Pacers still can win the division. But there's still a lot for them that's at stake, a lot for them to shoot for. But the security blanket everybody thought they had, including me, of going one and one this weekend and still making the postseason, doesn't actually exist. It would exist if the Heat lose one more time and the Magic win one more time. Uh, and if the Heat lose specifically to Dallas on Wednesday, that would give the Magic three chances to do it. Pacers can easily finish ahead of the Heat. There's just a lot at play that would make it very good for the Pacers to see the Heat lose to the Mavericks on Wednesday night on that back-to-back, but we'll see. The Mavs might have locked up five. Who knows what they'll 
what their level of effort will be. And that is, of course, the beauty of these late season games. Grizzlies played the Spurs Tuesday night. You might think, why are you bringing that up, Tony? I, not for the Pacers. It doesn't matter to them. That was the only game with no stakes at all in the NBA. That's what the playing tournament has created. Every team's trying to win or trying to manipulate their matchup or earn a tiebreaker or something around the NBA this time of season. I think that's wonderful. And I think that speaks to all the ripple effects that I've been talking about for the Pacers in their standings watch. They care about the Magic. Do they want the Magic to lose? They have the same number of wins as the Magic right now. Or do they want the Magic to win so it's easier for the Pacers to actually make the playoffs? Same kind of deal with the Heat and the Sixers, given their opponents. It's just all very tricky and convoluted. And I, I will try my best to keep track of it here for you on Lockdown Pacers. Every day this week, I think the third segment will be all about the standings and what it means for the Pacers. Uh, because the Pacers won this Tuesday game, their Friday game against the Cavs is guaranteed to be awesome, right? It's going to be a battle for a tiebreaker and potentially fifth place in the East, uh, it's potentially a chance to move up the Central Division standings, even if the Cavs win on Wednesday. So that game's going to be sweet, and that means we should do a crossover once again, like we did with the Heat last Sunday. So Chris Manning and I will get together for that one. Of course, we'll roll through shows into the weekend. I'll be in Cleveland and then back in Indy for the Pacers' final home game. It's simple, though. If that all sounded confusing, it's simple for the Pacers. They go 2-0. and They're a postseason team. Seed to be determined. They go 1-1. and They need some help. If they go 0-2, things will not be looking good for them, and they will likely be a playing team given how well Philadelphia is playing. But we'll have to see. Lots of games still to go. Lots of results that still could change things. The last two very important games that could have swung things significantly for the Pacers, Sixers in double overtime beat the Spurs. Heat in double overtime beat the Hawks. These double OT games killing the Pacers. We'll keep tracking all this here on the Lockdown Pacers podcast. Sorry for the shorter show. I'm running out of steam. My voice is very dry. My mouth is dry. I got to get some rest and edit these two podcasts, including Lockdown NBA. So thank you guys a ton for listening today. Hope you enjoyed today's show and enjoyed watching the Pacers score 140 points against the Toronto Raptors. We'll be back very soon talking more Pacers and their run to the end of the season. Tell then everybody have a wonderful day.